Welcome, <laughs> welcome all. Um, glad glad uh, to be here for yet another um, uh, our chain community co-op co-op hangout. Um, and just as uh, just want to recap what uh, uh, what we were talking about right at the top before we hit record, which is that uh, the asset transfer is just about done, and we're going to be releasing um, a Rock to um, take care of some existing obligations. Um, and, and that's kind of like the first test that the, the Ethereum assets, uh, um, uh, well, I mean, the first real test that the Ethereum assets uh, uh, work correctly. And then um, the marketing team and I will be picking a date to do the launch and we'll let you know as soon as that's available and we'll put that out on Slack. Um, but so we're, we're uh, ready to start running the process. Um, and we're excited about it. I'm super excited about this. I have been wanting to get this done for ages. <laughs> Love your waited. So it's one of the longest two and a half months of my life. <laughs> yeah. People are going to be excited. I feel people are going to be really excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm excited to be to to have have this done. So, um, and a lot of other really really good things have have been happening. Um. So uh, let's let's uh, talk about some of those. Um, one of the biggest things is that we the the compiler um, for Rolang we've now driven that out um, to about um, uh, to the point where where I can start testing the the, the Hello World contracts. Um, uh, so before we've even been funded. <laughs> <laughs> the, com the compiler for the Hello World Roland contracts is—it's uh, uh, is, it, just—it's—it's it's in place more or less. I'm gonna start testing, start testing all of that now. Um, so, so that, uh, you, you uh, and I've been very happy to have uh, engagement from a number of parties, but especially uh, Kent. Uh, he's KAS on Slack, and um, it looks like uh, uh, Kent might join us for a summer internship. I don't know. Uh, uh, we, we've been talking about that. I'd be very excited uh, to have him join us. Um, so that's uh, that's uh, good news. Um, and another uh, two other uh, nice updates on the technical front, and then we'll, we could talk about some other organizational things that are, are coming together. Um, uh, what one is um, uh, uh, so it looks like Vitalik has done some really nice work on implementing. Um, uh, um, uh, practical Byzantine fault tolerance as an economic protocol. Um, well, in, in other words, he has a set of slashing conditions um, that uh, that gives rise to a practical B B a PBFT, um, and that's that's kind of cool because it, it suggests something which I've been really hoping for, um, which is that there is a general transform from cons sort of traditional consensus algorithms to economically based consensus algorithms. Um, and that's, that's uh, that, um, and, so, and so what we want is, you know, a framework in which to be able to express that. And that's kind of the framework that we've been marching to, is this framework in which we can express the general picture. Um, and that's why you want certain, uh, certain uh, uh, characteristics about the formal account of this. Uh, so I'm uh, so in particular what it means is that you want to you want to find uh, uh, How do I say this the uh, in, in if, if for anyone out there who's familiar with category theory What we're saying is that that transformation on these consensus algorithms is a functor and so the consensus algorithms themselves are um, Are going likely to be morphisms in a particular category and I've, I've identified um, the candidate category for that, that that's completely consistent with everything we've been doing with, with uh, Rolang and Archain. Um, and, uh, and then the functor applies to transform consensus algorithms to economic uh, consensus algorithms. So uh, that's very exciting. Um, it also has practical import. Um, like right now, Ethereum is looking at the problem of what they will do uh, to transition the existing network from proof of work to proof of stake, right? Uh, it's a problem our chain won't have because we will be deployed with proof of stake. Um, so, but but um, but it's, but that situation is the kind of thing that has been driving what I've been talking about with respect to composition, right? 
So at some point, the Ethereum network is going to be composed of um, a network that is proof of work and a network that is proof of stake. And they have to make sure that over time, right, that everything is all uh, correct, right? So you're really looking at this kind of composed network. And what you'd like to be able to do is reason about these composed algorithms. Um, so that's, that's, uh, um, that's why the overarching framework um, that I've been proposing, you know, sort of has value. Uh, and, and I believe it will have value for the, a long time to come because um, the consensus algorithms will change over time. It's a, this is just a part of maintenance, right? Over time, we'll, we'll recognize that, oh, you know, for this, um, for this piece of the network, we don't have to have these kinds of assumptions. For example, we know, for example, you might know that you don't have the same kind of adversarial conditions or you don't have the same trust model. And so you can do these kinds of trade-offs between performance and, and, uh, and uh, um, um, uh, safeguards against, against certain kinds of adversaries. And as a result, the algorithms will change and they will be non-homogeneous um, uh, across the network. So you will have different consensus algorithms in different uh, sections of the network and you need to be able to reason about this. And that's why you need these kind of uh, overarching frameworks like the, like the ones that we've been working with. So that's, uh, that's another piece of the uh, technical update. And then also, Mike and I, looks like we have stumbled onto something that's really quite fundamental um, uh, that, that makes the, um, the ladle algorithm, which is the, uh, a, a key piece of the type checker for Rolang, um, uh, tick. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, um, because, you know, it's sort of a, it's a, uh, it's a little bit involved. <laughs> um, but, uh, before, before I go into that, let's, let's have some uh, organizational updates. Ed, did, uh, we had some news, right? We can't hear you, Ed. How about now? Yes, yay. All right, hey. All right my, uh, so uh, we've been preparing to uh, get ready for investment uh, with uh, into holding and then, a, and, and then some of that into the co-op, uh, and, and initially it's the majority into the co-op. Um, and so there's uh, agreements uh, that uh, are signature ready between the holding company and the co-op for a deferred payment of rocks. So uh, we'll, you know, we've negotiated up front that um, that to prepare for the investment, so that the investor doesn't have all these questions to say, well, uh, if we want rocks as part uh, or a bonus as as part of in, in addition to the uh, preferred stock in the holding company, could we get some? Yes. Um, uh, how, how will we uh, how will we um, value the holding company when you don't have assets yet? And we we would say, well, we have rocks, and these are expected to be more valuable over time. Um, uh, as as a um, again, not as a security, but as a um, uh, access token, or, or what will be converted to an access token. So there's these three um, uh, agreements. Um, for uh, one between the holding and the co-op. The other one is uh, engagement agreement to finish uh, or, or with um, with uh, the, the law firm that's helping us with transactions. And there's one for the holding company and one for the uh, cooperative. So those are all ready to sign and we'll do that on Thursday. That's the main update. And then uh, continuing working on the uh, pitch deck and business plan and, and, every, and other supporting documents for uh, investor pitches. Cool. I'm just drawing, drawing a picture of uh, uh, of uh, what what you said, so that people get, people get a sense of this. Oh, I've got the one uh, slide I can show um, that we could talk over. Let me see if I can present that correctly. Um, okay, uh, I I was just going to do it real time here. I'll just do a quick screen share. Uh, Mine's prettier. I'm sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But I can't show it since you're presenting. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'll, you, we we can we can show it afterwards, and then you can. So, so, so you can vote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. People can vote exactly. Right. <laughs> so, so, so here here's the uh, you know what what's what what Ed was talking about. Um, uh, we have essentially we're talking about an agreement here between these two um, and also another one between uh, the uh, the auto capital and uh, the holding company so here's here's what we're what we're signing uh, and, and and what it means right so so the first thing that Ed talked about was <clears throat> a kind of mutual relationship here that we have to address so that um, oh, well, wow. I wonder, do I have the, uh, the, the little row, um, uh, tokens that I can put there, rock tokens. Uh, I'll, I'll do that later, but so fonts. So I think it might be worthwhile to restate what those two are. Uh, the holding company is a corporation, right? There's actual stock in it. The investors are going to be getting preferred stock in the holding company. That's going to be making startup companies, building things on our chain. That's your basic corporation for profit. Right. The cooperative is going to be composed of members. There's no stock. There's no nothing, right? The members run the cooperative, and the cooperative is in charge of the public part of the R chain, the part that everybody owns. Right. Exactly. Um, Thank you, Evan. Yeah. That's exactly right. And so a similar kind of thing um exists on this side uh whoops yeah and, and as you're drawing that in addition to um the holding company paying uh for rocks it's a, a purchase agreement for rocks is it's, uh the the software deliveries that will all be open source are also specified uh uh, will be specified in there to say here's here's the milestones of deliveries here's the expected sequence of uh, components and dem demonstrable platform technology over time right and we um, uh, Greg and I and Navneet are going to be meeting on Friday to um, to, to start the, 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 the one more level of specificity we, we already have sort of an initial high level plan and we're going to work at the next level of plan for or what needs to get delivered. Right, exactly. So, so, so examples of the kinds of companies that the holding company will be incubating include um, things like um, what, what we call um, the R chain utilities or-, or, or um, Yeah, either roots or, you, or uh, uh, basics. That's yeah, exactly. From uh, Amazon for a second, yeah. Right, so, so, uh, so we were, sometimes we were, we were calling it roots, uh, also basics is another one. Um, but essentially these are, you know, things like wallets, um, time service, things like that. So that, yeah. that's, that's the sort of company that, that we need, uh, incubated. Um, another one, um, that's, that's, uh, in the works is a, uh, is a decentralized dating service. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a quick question, please? Yes, please. Who's speaking? Uh, this is Rishabh here. Uh, are there any conflicts? Yeah, hi, hi. Are there any conflicts of interest between the incubator and the uh, and the cooperative? Uh, not to the best of our knowledge. But what what might you be concerned about? Uh, generally, like in terms of voting rights, in case the cooperative wants something more of a socialistic agenda, and the company has a more profit driven. I mean, it's this is more dystopian, but it just came to my mind. Uh, sure, uh, un uh, understood. I, I think these these are the kinds of things that everybody needs to be concerned about. So we appreciate your diligence and your, uh, you know, uh, uh, interest in talking those kinds of things through. Um, hang on, just one second. Uh, so this so, is a free, free. I think that's a very intelligent question. But as of right now, both the holding company and the cooperative very much want the R chain compute platform to just work. Yeah. That down the line, that may actually become a concern. But at least for the foreseeable future, we don't probably have to worry too much about a conflict of interest between these two. 
but that is a, definitely a possibility one day that we will we will cross that bridge when we come to it. Yeah, I mean, that, in, in some sense, it becomes a good problem to have, right? Right. If if we're if we're at the point where where people are actually concerned about that, then that means we know we've got assets that are pe people are actually concerned about. <laughs> Right, yeah. right now, right now, these are all just you know, um, you know. Well, the way I think that would be resolved would be you'd probably put it to a vote for members in the cooperative, and the shareholders would have a shareholder vote in the holding company, right? Exactly. Well, yeah. For, and first, it's it's directors, and then yeah. um, depending on depending on the nature of the issue. Yeah. Um, well, one one thing that that has come up uh, along those lines um, was the makeup of the boards of both companies. And, and at least initially, um, the, the decision was that we would have a, a significant overlap in the boards. Um, and then over time, we'll see how that evolves. But, but at least initially, they are, they are, there's a significant overlap. Um, and, you know, from, from the point of view of the companies, um, this makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, uh, another, another way to think about this is if you just build a platform, the problem you have is everyone's going to say, well, who's going to adopt your platform? You know, how do you drive user adoption, all, all of that? And what we're doing is we're just saying, ah, oh, screw that. We're, <laughs> we're just going we're, we're gonna to jumpstart that whole thing by, by having a bunch of, of things that are already adopting this platform, right? That's how they, you know, that, that, that's, that's how they come into being, right? They use this platform and that's, that's why they're being incubated. Right. And at the same, by the same token, so then they also drive um, the requirements and deliverables on the platform itself. Right. So the, pl the platform um, could be a platform for lots of different applications. But first and foremost, these are the applications that are driving this platform. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the things that's most uh, uh, critical, time critical in, 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 in all of this is that these become the observables for the investors and not just auto capital, but the rest of the market, right? I mean, every week I get on here and I talk about, you know, a bunch of mathematics and software and, and computer science and things like that. And, you know, maybe 1% of the, you know, the general populace um, cares at all, <laughs> if that much. It's more, more like 0.001% cares about these kinds of things. But they, but but lots and lots of people can understand whether or not a decentralized dating service is working correctly, right? So this is the kind of observable that investors and the rest of the market can watch to see if this thing is delivering, right? So so that's that's the other way to think about this. There's sort of a chicken and egg whenever you're making a platform. Of you make the platform and other people go, okay, who's on it? And the people who are thinking of coming on it are going, okay, you need the platform first before I'll be on it, right? Yeah. <laughs> also taking an egg problem and proves that it works with somebody who's already on the platform. Yeah, exactly. So if we want to war game out the conflict of interest scenario that the person was just asking about, like let's imagine that one of these services gets successful and there's another person who's not in the holding company, like another company that is a competitor who might be a member in the cooperative because they want to get the rebate or something, right? Yeah, yeah sure. You would have a, a sort of a conflict of interest potentially where the holding company wants to benefit its own subsidiary and the cooperative has a member that is actually opposed to that and probably is lobbying and voting and trying to get it what it wants. And that's definitely something that may happen, but at least when we're at this chicken and egg problem scenario of getting the you know, driving platform adoption, I'm not sure conflict of interest is the biggest deal for us right now. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. That we activate. Cool. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. It keeps things a lot. Uh, uh, so Ed, do you have your diagram out? I'll stop screen sharing. Okay. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it shows something slightly different. Let's see. Hold on. Where is that? Oh, that one. Okay. Are you seeing the, the screen now? Yeah. Are you seeing the right screen? Um, so yeah, this is, this is, uh, uh, not showing the, the details of the, the agreement between our chain holdings and, and the cooperative, but but this this is showing uh, you know cash coming in from the investors into holdings, um, uh, an, an agreement between the holdings and the cooperative for the purchase of rocks and uh, uh, commitment to technology, and and the demonstrable milestones of, and then uh, obviously we have uh, the memberships and, and and membership tokens as or sorry, dividends to the membership as part of that overall equation. 
uh, and then the portfolio companies uh, that, that Greg was talking about. And uh, obviously the, the, those portfolio co companies have customers that pay in, in either, you know, cash or uh, ideal, you know, crypto tokens coming in. Um, and then the holding company would be taking a position in um, the portfolio companies and uh, in, in order to ultimately return value back to the, uh, the investors on the left. So that's, that's part of those agreements with, uh, you know, for example, da dating company and, um, and social network and uh, marketplaces and so forth. Any questions about that? For somebody asking a big picture question about why I have two entities, the holdings company is gonna be making proprietary software. Those portfolio companies are gonna be for-profit startups Right. The purpose of the cooperative is to facilitate open source software that nobody, particularly not the holdings company, actually owns. It's open source, it's free for everybody to use. Yeah, and and, and it's important that the <clears throat> the platform be protected because it's common infrastructure. It, it, exactly. Yeah, and and you know some 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 of the work the holding company does uh, may also be open source, especially when we're talking about the, the basic things that we want to become ubiquitous and are really enablers to accelerate the whole ecosystem. So, so the things like roots, you know, that's, that's something that, that we're, is likely to, that can have open source components. Yeah, I, I, I suspect that the wallet will be open source um, because that needs to be trusted, right? It's managing private key. Yeah. So, uh... Uh, what seems to be missing here is uh, uh, the uh, uh, worker cooperative aspect of uh, supporting the community and uh, building applications, uh, open source applications that support the community. Oh, ab absolutely. That's not part of this investment equation, but certainly there's other organizations and, and grassroots efforts and completely independent um, uh, uh, DAP uh, projects that can, can happen and, and, and start and support. Yeah. So we'll it's open source. So other people can, of course, build on it, right? It yeah. Like that's sort of baked into the concept of, of open source. And that's what we were hoping, Jim, that you and, and others will be articulating, right? So we should have a, another slide that sort of talks about um, the relationship of the cooperative to um, community and other uh, open source dApp and developers, as well as as um, uh, you know, independent folks, folks who are just out there uh, doing it on their own because they like it that way. I think I think a really important thing to 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 think about is honestly when you you know this thing needs to be up and running. You know, it needs to go to the main net, and then what really happened with the Ethereum development is as people saw the power of the platform, they started contributing to the core. You know, same with the Bitcoin development. So I think essentially, you know, once it's kind of just a very, a, a very sort of the core module is there of a running blockchain on a proof of stake, you know, the Casper uh, sort of stuff, then you're going to see a lot more people entering in. And that's when you start getting developers on board because people are going to be kind of not forking off, but they're going to be trying to work out you know, what can we place on this network? You know, what's its, its, its uh, malleability like? You know, what's its variance like? And that's where I ultimately I believe it's going to win. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that, that's exactly right. And, 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 and we, we've seen this kind of, we've seen this kind of uh, social dynamics uh, quite a bit. And, 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 and we, we, we imagine that it will play out very similarly. It happens for a lot of different projects, right? There's a, there's a core group, like if you, if you look at the development of Linux, it's, it's a very similar kind of social dynamics that, that went around um, the development of Linux. <clears throat> and typically what happens, you know, that, that makes it successful is some, um, some parties in industry pick it up and realize that, you know, this is something that really has a lot of legs and they run with it, right? So, so as an example, IBM saw that Linux was a, was a way to compete in the market in a, in a fundamentally different, you know, uh, you know, in a service-based approach, and and quite interestingly, I believe that they're they're there's having a similar kind of perception of Ethereum, which is why there's such a such a strong um, IBM Ethereum connection. So, uh, and and I I have a feeling that that something quite similar will happen um, uh, here, where well there will be some large industry players that pick up uh, what it is we're doing 
uh, and and kind of push it forward out to a, a, a larger uh, portion of the market. Um, okay, uh, I want to shift gears a little bit, unless there are other questions about the org organization or anything like that. And uh, uh, Kent, I noticed, is on, and he had some questions uh, just about Rosette and other things. Um, so I want to I want to shift gears and 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 uh, give give opportunity to, to ask technical questions about the platform and stuff like that. Um, so uh, Kent, are you are you still on? Do you want to? Yeah. Th thanks for allowing me in. Uh, no, no, no. It's this is open. It's completely open, right? That's that's kind of the whole whole point here. Um, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. uh, before uh, I before um, jumping directly to your questions, I'm gonna. I'm going to do like a little, um, uh, just a, a, a brief overview of the Rosette Actor model. Sounds um, good. And then, and then we can, and that will provide a little background so other people can ask questions. Um, so, so essentially in Rosette, uh, the, the sort of the <coughs> core, the core unit of a computation is an actor. So in Rosette, everything is an actor. I mean, everything is an actor. And you'll, you'll see what I mean by that in just a second. And an, an actor basically has four, four um, components to it. And you can see this reflected um, in, uh, in, in, in the, the, the C++ implementation of actors themselves. So a, an actor has, has a, an inbox or a mailbox. Okay? And the, the mailbox is where an actor receives, um, receives messages and then it's going to, um, uh, and, and from its point of view, the mailbox represents um, a serialization of the message, uh, uh, the, the incoming messages. So there, there could be lots of parties, that lots of other actors or lots of um, external system components, you know, sometimes called oracles, that are, are, are making requests of the actor. All those requests are effectively serialized and placed in a particular order inside the actor. So the kind of the the, the kind of non-determinism that is um, uh, that is witnessable or or, or, or or evinced inside Rosette is um, uh, uh, message arrival order non-determinism, right? Because the messages could arrive in any order, but the mailbox is essentially presenting a serial order to the actor, um, and then. And in addition to the mailbox, the actor has uh, what we will call an extension. Okay, and the extension, all it is, is a vector of values. So you can think of this as the state of the actor. So it's it's literally just. Um, go grab another shape here. It's literally just a kind of. Um, It's a vector, and inside each of these boxes, so dot, dot, dot out here, inside each of those boxes is another actor or a pointer to another, another Are you actor. Are your screen, Greg, because it's not shared right now? Oh, sorry, I thought I was sharing. Uh, my mistake, okay. So uh, an actor has a mailbox, and it has an extension, and the extension is um, just a vector of values. Okay, and then it has a meta, and all that is is a map. So this is the meta, and the meta is just a map from keys to indexes in the um, in the uh, the extension. All right, so it's it's literally just um, a little. You, you could think of it as a little tiny mini key value database. <laughs> Right, uh, where the meta is is a map where you have a key, like a symbol or an operation or something like that, and that gets you an index into the extension, and that's how you do lookups of state in the actor via symbols. Right, so when you say, uh, um, so in when you look at the code, let me give an example of such code. Um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, Zork. Um, C 
see if that's any good. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so if you look here, here's an actor called system configuration. Um, and what it does is it represents for the particular system that you're running on um, some important um, information about the system itself, like, like the OS, the architecture, the environment, page size, character alignment, character size, those kinds of things. Um, and if you look here, you'll see things like um, in the declaration of this actor system configuration, you'll see this keyword slots. And it, you know it's a keyword because it has an ampersand at the end of it. So the keyword slots, um, and then you mention the slots and their default values. Okay, so um, it, in terms of this other picture here, um, right here. So the meta is going to manage the map between the symbol character size and the place in the extension where that value is going to be stored. All right, so that's what the, the meta does. And then um, uh, if you look at the C++ code, you'll see parent. I'm going to use this more general notion. This is the shared behavior object. So you can think of this as essentially like a V table in C++ or, or uh, um, you know, a V table in Java. It's the, it's the map from messages to method bodies. And messages are represented by operations. So when, you, when, a, when a message comes in at the mail, mailbox, it's essentially um, uh, of the form operation and arguments. And then the shared behavior is another lookup device, just like the meta is. The shared behavior object allows you to go from that operation to the particular method body that you're going to run um, in response to receiving that message. Uh, so that those are the those are the components of the actor. Um, those are the structural components. And then in terms of the concurrency, there are uh, just a few things that that need to be understood. Um, the actor, uh, the actor's mailbox. Um, I have to. It, there's there's some subtleties here. In a regular method, as opposed to something that is a pure method. In a regular method, when the actor pulls the message out of the mailbox, the mailbox is locked, and all of the messages begin that are being sent to the actor begin piling up until the actor unlocks the mailbox. And what that does is it provides a concurrency control mechanism to have a consistent view of the state. So what the actor uh, then must do to unlock the mailbox is to call update. And what update does is it, it um, provides any updates to the values in the extension. After that point, um, the actor can continue to be processing, but it will not change, or any changes to the extension will not be seen by subsequent versions of the actor. So at the moment, you, the way you can think about this is, at the moment that the actor um, calls update, um, a new copy of the actor or a new thread is spun up and begins handling the next message in the mailbox. The old actor can continue to process, but none, uh, no state changes are visible to downstream actors, i.e. actors that are processing messages that are later than the one this was processing. So hopefully that's, that's a clear explanation. Um, and and the difference between a regular method and a pure method is that the pure method calls the update right up front. So, so it, it, unlocks, it unlocks the mailbox because when you've said pure, you're saying that you're not going to update the extension at all. It's, it's side effect free. Uh, so that's the difference between those. And then finally, the reflective method includes as a part of the computation an actor representing the continuation that's associated with uh, processing that particular mailbox, uh, that particular message in the mailbox. That's Rosette in a nutshell. It took me less than five minutes, I think, to explain it. Um, uh, just under five minutes. So now, with that set up, Kent, you had some questions. Yeah, that no, was great. Um, so, actually, this is perfect. Um, essentially, I was bumping into the issue that 
um, I, I mentioned a bit on the Slack chat, but um, the definition of the, I guess, the built-in operations. Yeah. So what I picture is, um, should I post the code in the chat? Uh, or you um, can just do a screen share okay. if you want. Sure, that works. Um, maybe even off the Slack channel. Um, so uh, let's see. Actually, let me do it off C line. Um, can you see that? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so we were looking at the the Rosette file the boot, the boot. boot. Yep. And this function right here. Yep. Essentially, I believe what it's doing is kind of initializing all the built-in operations that were kind of defined throughout the Rosette source. That's correct. Yeah. So, so basically, mm -hmm. there, there, there okay. are a bunch of uh, uh, built-in foreign functions, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's what this is doing is it's providing all the built in the built in functions that allow the system to 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 work right hmm. and so I guess my confusion was that in this first let um so quickly just the way you read the let is you have the expression and this will be assigned to the variable m and say here um whatever this is will be assigned to p which makes sense and but what's happening is that the operation that's passed in through the proc is like the the bindings is added to the extension just as i guess greg mentioned earlier and for some reason there's another meta or, or a meta, I guess, actor that in which the the bindings is again added. No, so, I mean essentially all that's all, all that's going on here. Mm -hmm. the, 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 you make a new opern, um, and that's going to give you a meta. But mm -hmm. now you want all of the primitives to share the, that meta with that one, so they all have the same meta. That's what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I guess how would the I guess how would it differ if instead of init op it was just like op? Oh well like, then you wouldn't run the initialization code. So is this op referring to the same thing yeah. as init op? Yeah, uh, so so um, it, it, it doesn't really matter, right? Because mm -hmm. what so you're gonna run these two in sequence. Mm -hmm. You're, you're receiving, so let's see what happens when we do p display. Display is bound for op. The first mm -hmm. thing we're going to do is call init on display. Mm -hmm. and then we're going to add the result of calling init, which I believe is just the initted op itself. So it's just op. But we can, so, go, we can prove that. And, and, and we can see that init is actually bound to prim init. So you can go look and, <clears throat> at prim init. Can I just ask whether there are not two actors when you call init op, is there op and then like the result of init op? Are those two different actors or? No, they're the same. Okay. I would have so it's just one unlocked actor. That's correct. Okay. And remember that, that uh, so, so init won't return until, uh, uh, so, so first of all, we, have, we would have to prove that init returns op. I, it, you know, it's been, decades since I've looked at this code, but, mm -hmm. um, but, but I'm pretty sure that init returns op. And init won't, init won't return op um, unless op is unlocked, right? Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and it doesn't matter in either case because op is the target uh, of the init message, but, but something else is the target of uh, oh wait, no. Uh, meta, yeah. Op is the target of meta. So in this case, you can't get to this without op being unlocked. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not it's just not not even possible. And the reason is because they're in sequence. 
So you'll do this and complete this whole, the evaluation of this entire expression, all, the entire ad will be completed before you get to the meta. So can I just ask whether this would essentially be the same code? Uh, no, it isn't. Why is that? Uh, unless, uh, unless, so, so in general it won't be because you don't know whether init is side affecting. Okay, so if you, if you want those to be the same, you would have to inside that do a let of init op. So let, you know, mm -hmm. iop be the result of init op and then use iop uh, in that place. Okay. It's the difference between functional versus side affecting code. So if there is not any side effects. If there's not, if there's okay. not a side effect, then they're not the same because, because op is not the same as the result of init op. Okay. I see. So, I mean, I guess the result of this is that there's, so, I mean, why is it that you need to add the bindings to both the, the operation itself and the meta of the operation? You're not adding the bindings to the meta. Look at where these, where the, where the parens end, right? So the add only extends out to there. Well, sorry, I meant like, the, in here, the add um, the bindings is added to like the dummy um, right. op. This is just this line up here is like basically just recapitulating what proc does. The only difference between the two is that this proc mm -hmm. um, is utilizing the meta of that operation, so they all share exactly the same meta. But that meta also has a bindings slot, right? Yeah, but that's not what's being addressed here. We're not. Well, I mean, is that what's happening here? No. Interests. Hmm. That's not what these. That's not what they, we're adding bindings <laughs> uh, here, and this is all completed, right? And then we call meta. That's the that's the result of this seek. So these two. These two lines are completely independent. We do, we do A and then we do B. Okay, right? so. The result of B is bound to M and the result of B happens to be the meta of the op and that's what's being called here. So I'm just saying like, I mean, I understand that there's two separate things, but like the first part just creates like uh, essentially a new op that has a binding slot, right? Is that not even correct? The, the first uh, it definitely uh, creates a new op, right? Yeah. And then, and then you add uh, bindings uh, to op. That's so right. that first op now has the bindings, right? That's correct. Okay. And then that is basically that op is used in, is assigned to the meta of the second op. Uh, that's correct. Okay. The, 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 the meta is given the, the, the meta of the first op is yeah, okay. the meta of the second one and the third and the fourth and the fifth and so on, right? Every time you call P, you're setting the meta of the op that is the argument to be the meta of the dummy op. Got it. Yeah. I think that's clear. Thank you. Sure. Sure. No worries. Uh, working through these kinds of things is, is useful. Um, awesome. Indeed. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and I think, you know, these kinds of conversations, other developers will be coming along and they'll be having similar kinds of questions, mm -hmm. which is why we, uh, why it's, it's a good idea to uh, have, these, uh, have these little recordings. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, all right. So were there any other uh, uh, topics or, or questions that people wanted to ask? But, you know, we've got about 15 minutes and I want to open it up. Uh, the conversation to and anyone who has any any questions or comments. Uh, a quick question: uh, How is the logic of forking being uh, addressed for uh, uh, Archain? Like, uh, is it open on a, a proof of stake or a consensus vote, or are there some veto voting mechanisms in place? Ah, yeah. So, so yeah, absolutely. So the 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 Archain governance 
is um, laid out. So, so, so here, the community is the uh, entity that decides that. Um, and that's, so which community do we, are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the membership of the Archain Cooperative. Okay. So if you want to participate in the governance of the platform, then you become a member of the Archain platform. And how the Archain, how the membership operates is laid out in the bylaws of the Archain Cooperative. Effectively, it's one member, one vote, but there are some subtleties there, uh, which is worthwhile, you know, you know, we can talk, we can have a special session to talk through them. Um, but, but essentially it's, you know, it's a democratic process. Um, and, uh, and that membership decides um, when forks happen. Sure. Uh, so there are no veto mechanisms like voting, like in the UN Security Council, nothing like that, right? Uh, no, but I mean, it's, you know, the, the, um, in general, there's a relationship between the board of directors and the membership. Um, but, but by and large, you know, the, the structure is set up so that the membership has, uh, you know, a large vote, uh, voice in this process. I think the, the thing to note about that is the, the chief power that the members exercise regularly is going to be picking who the directors are. Right. The directors need to run for election. So the director says, you know, it's going to be my policy that I'm going to do X. The members are like, well, I like X, so I'm going to vote for that guy. And they also have the ability to do just vote on policy. So if you are a member, you can have a specific topic of vote that you bring up in advance of the membership meeting, and then that's just going to be voted on by the members directly rather than having the directors make the call after being elected. Yep. Thank you for that clarification. Does that make sense, for shop? Yeah. Thanks a lot, Greg. Yeah, sure. Of I'm course. Uh, yeah, so, so, so uh, we, we felt that the cooperative structure had kind of the right, you know, social governance characteristics. Um, we've also, we're, we're also well aware that we're very naive. Uh, we, we, we really don't, um, you know, we, we don't even know what we don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so what we've tried to do is to make it so that the, the, um, the governance is uh, um, something that we can update. You know, over time, we can change the structure. Um, you know, utilizing the structure, we can, we can update the structure uh, in case we learn, that, learn we, get, we gain some experience and we can learn. Um, that, that, you know, governance would be conducted more effectively or more fairly or more efficiently if we adopt certain uh, changes to the, to, mo to the model. Then, of course, we don't want that to be too easy. Otherwise, you know, governance will be shifted this way and that way and the other without really um, getting anywhere. So we, we've, tried, we've tried to balance those two things as well. Sure. And uh, another small uh, conflict of interest, this might be in the future, but I think it's important is that in case an open source and a proprietary software model for a particular industry is equally competitive, which one would the board or be more preferable on? Would it be more pro-profit or more pro-people because it's possible like the Linux model is successful for multiple industries, which happens in the due course of time? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, th I think that's, that's a good question. But at, at the end of the day, um, you know, we're hoping that the platform gets to be, gets to the point where Oh, we're, we're hands off on that on that question, right? I mean, it would that would only be the case if if there were um, you know competing features that needed to be released. Um, in other words, that the, the there needed to be modifications to the platform, um, and and at that point, because the platform is open source, both of those entities are free to take it on themselves to, to modify or change the platform. And, uh, um, and then the question is whether or not that's a, that's a hard fork. Um, and if it is a hard fork, you know, then, then it comes up as a question of governance, right? But so, yeah. so it's, there should be lots and lots of stages before you get to the point where you have to make a decision between open source versus uh, proprietary. Um, in general, uh, platform changes must all be open source. That's Absolutely. Right? We let the invisible hand decide. Yeah. As Adam. 
Uh, so 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 there's there's nothing in the platform that isn't open source. Specific applications, they you know, it's their decision as to whether their their uh, their their source is open or not. Remember that um, it's going to be difficult for um, difficult but not impossible to uh, to have contracts be completely um, proprietary because you know the, the contracts are going to show up on the blockchain yeah absolutely so so you can have portions of uh, an application that that um, executes that are you know in software that is not in the blockchain itself um, uh, and that can be proprietary uh, well proprietary doesn't mean secret I mean you could have a copyrighted smart contract that people would be able to read it would still be your property I think that might be one thing that some of these proprietary startups are going to end up doing. Uh, that's true. It's a good point. It's just, it's hard. It's much harder to protect at that point because. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And would these rules be separate on side chains or would they be uh, tantamount in a similar manner? Uh, can you elaborate your question a little bit? There are a number of different ways I can interpret this. Uh, I just wanted to understand that as for Bitcoin vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, are there separate rules for side chains or is it similar in our coin as hypothesized? Um, again, we, we can't really control. Um, so let, 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 me, let me take a step back. Um, the, the, the nature of our chain is such that um, but we control things using namespaces, um, so it's un it's unlikely that there are going to be side chains. Um, there will be the the same R chain, but with different namespaces. Um, in, in which case, um, the same rules apply, right? Uh, so so there's there's that's so so uh, the architecture itself kind of answers that question. Um, uh, for us, uh, we, we don't have to we don't have to worry about that quite as much. Um, however, if someone you know starts up a separate chain um, just using the code base, um, then that's their prerogative, right? I mean, we, we can't do much about it, can we? And if it's open source, it's open source. So we don't we don't get to take them to court and say, "Hey, you're using our software." <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not what open source means. <laughs> no. All right, thanks. That's enough question sure. for the Yeah, cool. Uh, awesome. Were there any other questions? Well, Rashab, I think it's so cool that you're uh, you're engaged at this hour of the night. It's the the middle of the night in India. So, uh, very yeah. Cool. I met with uh, these rich uh, billion dollar CEOs running e-commerce companies and, they, and, and they're worried about blockchain marketplaces coming up the other day. That's so awesome. Know. They should be shaking in their boots. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, there's, yeah, the centralized organizations won't go away overnight. Right. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Hey, um, this earlier conversation uh, reminded me of a question I asked in Slack, which I, I subsequently got the answer. Um, from, from Kent in chat, but I thought it was interesting to share, which, and it, it, it may be somewhat of a naive question, but just to give some background, in, in the simple transactions in Bitcoin, you know, the whole, the, the whole stack language is uh, visible on the blockchain. You can see, you know, for simple sends, exactly what's going on and it's transparent. And then it, become, it can become a little less transparent with like pay to script hash. You don't really know what the hash is of um, and on Ethereum, um, the, you know, the byte the byte code I assume is is on the Ethereum blockchain, and you don't really know what the source is. Um, I, I assume. And so, so I asked the question on um, on our chain. You know, do you see the the Rolang source code? And uh, just want to check in with Greg. The answer is no, unless you go out of your way to put some debugging flags in in the compilation pipeline or whatever. Um, all you see is the the rosette uh, code, and that would be very that would be difficult to to decompile and to understand what it's doing from a logical perspective. Yes, yes. However, um, yeah. the, the, it, there's high value in publishing your code to the blockchain 
um, so that you have um, proof um, that the code you're running is the code that was type checked, right? Ah, uh, got it. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, that, so that, this, that's, that's where the value comes in. Yeah, and this this tied in with um, the the uh, earlier conversation about both proprietary and and then just the whole source code. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, let's see. We've got four minutes. Let's see if I can do this in four minutes. I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly show. Uh, this is this is again just uh, brain candy for for people who are interested in this kind of thing. Um, so so probably uh, um, people have heard people who are in technology have heard of the idea of the power set. Um, so if I so for example, if I have the set consisting of the characters A, B, and C, right, then I can consider all of the subsets, right? So so the subset that uh, has just A and B in it is, you know, it's clearly a subset of A, B, and C. The subset that has um, B and C in it, uh, or let's say A and C in it, um, and also the subset that has um, uh, C and B in, or B and C in it, and then we can also talk about um, uh, the subsets that have um, just say A and the subsets that just have B and the subsets that just have C. Uh, and then finally, we can talk about the empty subset. Right, so so there's a little lattice, right? And, and if you you can you can write out the connection, you know, you can write out sort of the graph that that is associated with, you know, clearly, um, you know, this is contained in everything, right? And I, I won't do all of them, but you know, clearly this is contained in everything, and. Um, a is contained in these three here, and so on. So this this little structure here is uh, often called the, the power set. And if you count the number of, of things here, we have one. Well, it's it's obvious just by looking at their eight, right? And so the original set has has three elements. The power set has has eight elements, um, and if you were to do the same thing for the set that was just A and B, you would see it would have four elements. If you just do um, the same thing with a set that just has one element, you see the power set has two. So one goes to two, two goes to four, three goes to eight. Uh, if you do four, you'll see it goes to 16. So you'll see that there's some relationship between uh, two to the N uh, and, uh, and the set with N elements. So this is, this is a sort of a common thing uh, it, it turns out to be quite um, quite subtle. Uh, this idea of the the set of all sub or the the collection of all sub objects of a particular collection, um, and one of the things that's that's hardest uh, that, that 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 becomes a challenge uh, to to get a handle on this thing um, is that very it grows so fast that very quickly you exceed notions of computability. Um, and in fact, you, you exceed some of our, our you know, our biggest uh, intuitions uh, about the, uh, um, our, our, our most refined intuitions. So, for example, there, there was a famous question as to whether um, the infinity of the real numbers or the infinity of the continuum was exactly the same as uh, the infinity that you arrive at by taking the, the countable infinity of the natural numbers and you know taking the set of all subsets of the natural numbers and that turns out to be independent of the axioms of set theory so that that gives you some sense of how subtle this idea is um and in particular when you uh, if you want to try to generalize this to other collections like 
graphs or lists, right? So you can, you know, sets forget order and they forget duplication. So if I put another A in here, I'll just get back A, B, C, you know, and if I, if I switch the order of, of um, B and C, it doesn't matter as a set. Right? We can't see that kind of thing. But lists, you know, they can absolutely see that kind of thing. Uh, it, but you can still consider all the sublists of a list. Trees can see uh, other kinds of structure, and you can consider all the subtrees of a tree. Uh, and so the question is, does this idea of all the sub-objects of an object, or all the sub-parts of a, of a component, um, is there a general way to describe this? And it looks like we have discovered one. And this turns out to be very useful in reasoning about the, uh, the, the, the type checking algorithm, or, or in particular relating the model checking to the type checking. Um, to the, to, uh, sorry, relating in the type checking, relating the type checking as model checker to type checker as proof checker. Um, uh, so I won't go quite into all of the details because I'm, I'm late for stand up, but I'll just quickly say um, a, a couple of points here. Uh, it turns out that all the collections um, that, that we're interested in are represented by monads. That's why we've, we've made a lot of hay around this idea of, uh, so for example, even the, uh, in, in Rolang, even the channels where you send messages, which are a lot like the mailboxes of actors, are monads. Uh, and we give them uh, a monadic uh, treatment and a monadic presentation and, and code probes them using monadic syntax. So, so monads cover all the collections we're interested in. And uh, the kinds of monads that we are interested in have uh, a property, which is that you can, you can naturally and easily define the notion of a derivative. Um, so the, and the derivative turns out to be the, a one-hold context. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So if you think about writing down a term, so monads can be typically thought of as, as uh, captured by a term language. Um, and so the context would be like taking the term and knocking a hole in it. And uh, if you think about it in terms of trees, imagine that you've got a tree and you, you whack out some subtree of that tree. So now you've got a tree with a hole in it and you can put different kinds of subtrees into that hole. So... So what did I just say? I just said that the monads M that we're considering support a notion of derivative, which defines the one hold context. And then you can do one more thing, which is really cool, which is you can define locations in a, um, in a, in a container or, or structure defined by the monad. Uh, and that's going to be pairs. So these pairs are a context and the thing that fills the context. So, and this pair together constitutes evidence or a witness that this thing is a sub-object of the comp composite object. So here's what I mean by that um, in, in, in more detail. Suppose that K is some one hold context that lives inside delta of M or the derivative of M. And M prime is uh, an element of M. And so if this is you know, the, uh, the, uh, the data type list, then M prime would be a particular list. Or if this is the data type set, then M prime would be a particular set. And now when you have it be the case that M is, is equal to K of M, I'm sorry, M is equal to the uh, K of M prime, then what that says is that this pair is the evidence that M prime is a sub-object of M. That, that alone is, gives us justification to define a new kind of power object. So the new kind of power object, which we will write as um, curly P, let me go find it here.
There we go. So curly P of M is when you apply it to, remember, lists and sets take things like, um, you know, a list of ints or a list of characters. So when you apply it to whatever you can apply your monad to, um, then you get back, you take the monad and you want, so remember that our power set here was a set of all subsets. So the thing we want on the outside is going to be our, our data constructor, our monad. And then inside, what we want is all of the, the, the sub-objects. So we need a witness for each sub-object relationship. And it turns out these pairs are exactly that witness. So we want the delta of m applied to x together with m applied to x. And that is our new notion of power object. And this turns out to be both monadic and computationally tractable. So this is a, this is a really, really nice uh, result um, because it, it allows us to characterize a lot of aspects of the type system that might otherwise be harder to prove. Um, so, and, and it's also quite fundamental because it relates um, it, it relates uh, the power object to um, the derivative, which is a surprising result. Um, this also means that we have a notion of negation, which relates the power object to negation, which is a surprising result. So you'll see more of this kind of information in the behavioral type stuff on Slack. But again, um, to me, this is this is super super exciting. And hey, you know. Like how often do you get to go and tell your kids, I found a power object. <laughs> um, all right, I'll shut up <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and head over to, uh, head over to uh, uh, the dev standup, which I'm very late for. Uh, thanks everyone and uh, talk to you soon. Thanks everyone. Ciao, ciao. Yeah, thank you, see you guys. You win.